Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome back uh, after the coffee break. Um, my name is Mark Dweck. I'm uh, a cardiologist interested in imaging here, here in Edinburgh. And uh, I hope you're as excited about this session as I am. Uh, we have, uh, I think it's safe to say, two of the, the world's experts in cardiovascular imaging uh, here with us today. Uh, Zahi Fayad from uh, New York and uh, Dave Newby from, from here in Edinburgh. And um, uh, these two guys are, have been, I guess, mentors to me in my career, so I'm very excited to hear them speak. Uh, it's great to have Zahi here uh, all the way from New York. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, he uh, is really a pioneer in the, in the world of uh, cardiovascular imaging. Uh, started off with MRI, is that f fair to say? Plaque imaging in uh, the coronary arteries. He was one of the first people to, to do that with MRI and then has moved into other areas, uh, including PET imaging, uh, nanomedicine. He's got this group in uh, New York with every kind of scanner that you could imagine. And uh, it's great to welcome him here to talk about uh, PET R MR imaging and how we might use that in the future. Thank you, Hizai.
So uh, thank you, Zahi. That's a, a fantastic talk. Um, I've got a couple of questions, if I may. Uh, the first one is, what's the human equivalent of the cat on the cage? What's the equivalent? The human equivalent, if you're doing the human study. Um, so you can, you can think of that if, if you, for example, um, uh, in a room with a person that is very aggressive uh, and, and kind of trying to dominate uh, the conversation or the situation, they've been shown that this actually creates uh, stress and, uh, and creates stress that is going to be maybe a permanent damage depending on if you're able to do it or not. So, so this would be the person, maybe Donald Trump in the room, this will be maybe a little bit difficult. <laughs> Are there any other questions in the audience? We're going to do a tweet by Donald Trump. <laughs> I mean, if, if there is another one, I've got another quick question. I mean, you, you showed very nicely the link between brain, vascular information, cardiac events. Do you want to talk also a little bit about the reverse, like how yes. va vascular the disease in the vascular good might question. affect good uh, brain disease? Yeah. yeah, good question, Mark. And, and, and I'm sorry I went throughout a little bit fast, and I did not mean to imply this directionality. We actually don't know the real direction. It's very hard to actually tease out this thing. I w I'm assuming there will be both sides. Uh, so, so we re and, and I think the study that, that we, we, will, we are putting together starting this September, because of this multiple group aspect, and we're teasing out a lot of things in the brain. We're looking at connectivity. We're looking at all, all these different circles. It's really state of the art from that point of view. It may help a little bit on that directionality, but I cannot at all talk about this. It's, 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 very, it's unknown. It's unknown, yeah. Okay, great. So um, unless there's any uh, further questions, I'd like to thank you, Zahi, for an excellent talk and uh, welcome Professor Newby up uh, onto the stage to deliver his lecture. He, he's going to talk about now uh, uh, imaging of the vulnerable plaque. So we heard uh, a little bit about that from Zahi, a nice introduction. And I guess Dave's going to uh, talk more about uh, how we can pick up or try and pick up these plaques that might yeah. cause uh, in, uh, myocardial infarctions and strokes in the future. Thanks very much, Mark, and, and I just want to thank Zahi again for spending the time to come today to share and celebrate our, uh, our meeting today. So my topic today is to talk about the vulnerable plaque, uh, and I probably don't need to tell this audience, but just to remind you that 1990 was a very important year. You know, trying to work out why that was. Well, actually, that was the year that cardiovascular disease overtook uh, any other disease in terms of more people died from cardiovascular disease than anything else ever full stop and it continues of course to rise and rise and rise so that's more than infectious disease more than any other disease areas so that's why uh, certainly the vulnerable plaque is going to be very critical because ultimately that's what causes most of the cardiovascular disease that we see so what I'm going to do very quickly over the next 10-15 minutes is go through identifying the vulnerable plaque uh, and the implications of that and obviously first of all you have to identify the plaque now as a cardiologist Usually what happens is we guess. We've got all these lovely tests, uh, not that anything wrong with MR perfusion uh, or other perfusion techniques, but ultimately none of these modalities actually look at the plaque. Even invasive coronary angiogram, we see an intervention going on there, doesn't actually look at the plaque, it looks at the lumen. You actually don't see the plaque at all. And actually if you look at cardiologists when they apply all those techniques, they're pretty damn good at picking out this high-risk people because uh, hazard ratio of seven that they are certainly can pick out the high-risk ones, but if you actually look at those that have an MI or die from an MI, uh, a third of them have actually been told by the, car the smart cardiologist uh, that uh, you have non-cardiac chest pain. So we're not doing a perfect job. Obviously, that's where CT coronary angiography comes in. Uh, Nazahi has alluded to that is the best technique if you want to actually non-invasively look at uh, the uh, coronary arteries. Uh, and so uh, we've certainly... Ha uh, Together in the imaging center with uh, Edwin and Michelle, we've looked at uh, identifying coronary plaque with CT. And of course, we performed the Scott Heart trial, uh, which uh, was a multi-center study. Uh, the vast majority actually were imaged here in Edinburgh, but also imaged in Glasgow and in Dundee. 12 centers across Scotland. And as you know, we randomized over 4,000 patients. And that was able to really help the cardiologists because it certainly improved, more than doubled their certainty of the diagnosis of coronary disease. Uh, and uh, that really was very helpful because that changed the patient's treatment, it changed their management, uh, and ultimately it changed their outcome. Uh, this is again unpublished data with the latest follow-up from the Scott Heart trial. Uh, at 1.7 years it was borderline statistical significance, and as you can see now, highly significant, a almost a halving of your chance 
of having a fatal or non-fatal myocardial infarction purely by using an imaging test, which I think is, is remarkable. All you're doing here is taking a picture, and yet you can halve the rate of subsequent myocardial infarction. And that's because it really tells you who has the coronary artery disease, who has the plaque, and who doesn't. And of course, uh, overall, the trial was able to clarify the diagnosis in about a quarter, uh, reduced, uh, it actually increased the diagnosis of coronary disease, or actually perversely reduced the diagnosis of angina because it was better at selecting those people, changed management, and improved outcome. And that's why the NICE guidance has now changed at the end of last year, uh, and it now recommends as a first line test if you go to your uh, uh, clinic and you're not sure which to do, rather than the six or seven different imaging modalities that you can use, you should go straight for CT carrier angiography if you're not sure. Uh, about the diagnosis. So that's how identifying the plaque. Of course, the holy grail is actually finding the plaque that's going to give you the heart attack. Uh, and um, this is where, of course, Mark's work come in, and uh, uh, Zahi alluded to this. Just want to remind you of the story of this and how important in science is to follow what you find. So Mark uh, <coughs> was actually doing a study in aortic stenosis patients. Aortic stenosis has a lot of calcification. And he saw that the, the, the aortic valve lit up beautifully with sodium fluoride. But what he also noticed, it was, uh, it was taken up in the coronary arteries and the aorta. And a bit like Jenna, when he didn't throw his plates out when it was infected uh, with fungus and discovered penicillin, uh, we followed that idea. And then Mark went on and looked at these patients with aortic stenosis, and looked at those that had more or less fluoride uptake, and showed that those that had more fluoride uptake had a higher Framingham risk score i.e. that they had more coronary disease. So out of that finding, uh, Mark and I put a grant together uh, to the Chief Scientist Office to look at fluoride uptake. Uh, and Nick Joshi was a fellow that did this work. Uh, and as uh, Zahi's already alluded to, to a certain extent, this is a patient with a coronary angiogram who's having a heart attack. You can see the clot actually in the coronary artery there. This is the PET-CT scan, and we're using sodium fluoride as a marker of early microcalcification. Uh, to identify the vulnerable plaque. And the nice thing about this CT scan is you can see macrocalcification in the left coronary artery here, no fluoride uptake. Macrocalcification, not that much, but intense fluoride uptake, which is exactly where that clot is sitting in the heart artery. And when we looked at patients who came in with ST elevation MI for this one, for example, you can see that the ostium here of the LED is completely sawn off. There should be a big artery up here. You can see it ghosting in a little bit. And that's exactly where the fluoride lit up. And it didn't matter which patient we looked at, we saw the same thing over and over again. We had so many images, we couldn't put them all in. And 93% of the time, we could identify the culprit plaque, as defined by the interventional cardiologist in the cath lab. Uh, we're still arguing over a couple of those cases because we think we got, they got the wrong culprit vessel, but that's another story. But when we look at the, uh, the highest uptake, it clearly was able to identify the culprit plaque, sodium fluoride uptake, compared to the same patient who had disease elsewhere but uh, didn't have the uptake in the other vessels. That was not true with FTG, and Zahi's already alluded to the issues associated with FTG uh, being taken up by the heart and not really very good in the coronaries because it's just too small. Now, we wanted to look at the coronary arteries, but none of the patients wanted us to give us their coronary arteries to look at. So we took on Alex Vesey, uh, who was a, a vascular surgeon, to look at this work, and what Alex does uh, for a living, you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. But rather than throwing this away, we stick it through our PET scanner, uh, PET micro PET CT scanner, and you can see beautifully here uh, how you can break down the, the plaque into components of, of uh, calcification. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, here, uh, the blue is actually the fluoride uptake, uh, and the green is actually fluoride and CT calcification. So we could break down that and here you can see a, a stroke patient uh, who uh, was taking part of that. When we looked at the histology under the microscope, we could see that the plaques that lit up with fluoride had a necrotic plaque in it, horrible, gooey necrotic plaque, which was clearly very uh, uh, inflamed and vulnerable. And when we looked at it using the slices, you can see here alizarin in red, which lights up active calcification. This is the CT scan. You see calcium here, but not here. And this is the PET with fluoride. You can see the calcium does line up with that. But here, intense staining, uh, sorry, intense uptake with fluoride, no calcium, no macro calcification, yet a lot of 
uh, calcification activity. So the fluoride is telling you where the calcium will be if you survive that long in the next two or three years to calcify off your plaque. Um, in the interest of time, I'll skip that. Uh, and Alex went on to compare fluoride imaging because it is better in the carotids uh, uh, than uh, sodium um, than in the heart because uh, you haven't got the myocardial overspill. Although you do have problems with the muscles in the neck, as that white arrow is showing there, that you can get some uptake in the, in, in the muscles of the neck, and so it's not always a perfect technique, whereas you don't get that with the, uh, um, sorry, uh, it's that one there, is the muscle, um, uh, which you don't get with the fluoride technique. And when he compared and contrasted them, he found that fluoride was actually much better at predicting the culprit plaque than FDG. And actually, if you go back to the original studies, uh, the fluoride signal was not actually present in the majority of patients who had a symptomatic plaque. I think what FDG is telling you is more about general inflammation in the vasculature, whereas the fluoride is telling you that that inflammation's got so bad, you need to calcify off that plaque to stop it rupturing uh, from the necrotic inflammation. So that's all well and good, David. What about the clinical impact of assessing these things? So we are looking at this. Uh, Alistair, Gray, uh, Alistair Moss sorry, uh, is, is looking uh, in his uh, um, sudden cardiac death study. There's a good reputation for the University of Edinburgh, of course, with Burke and Hare, uh, notoriously using this. But he's taking, and this is a post-mortem coronary angiogram here of someone that died. Obviously, they've got normal coronary arteries. But we are doing some post-mortem CT work and also would like to do some post-mortem PET work, which is work in progress. Uh, this is a pig heart, uh, and this is us putting bits of pig hoof down the coronary artery, uh, but be able to see that we can see that with fluoride. So uh, we also want to explore sodium fluoride PET coronary angiography in sudden cardiac death victims, which I think is also an important aspect. We're also doing a multi-center trial across the UK, uh, Wellcome Trust funded, uh, eight centres across the UK, taking people who've just had an MI and doing PET fluoride to see whether we can predict who then goes on and has a myocardial infarct. Is this a clinically applicable technique? Does it prospectively predict heart attacks? The studies I've shown you were people who'd come in with a heart attack. We knew they had a heart attack. Uh, their plaque had already ruptured, but what about predicting the future? So that's something I think that we'll see as, we, as the years go by, this should report in about four to five years. We're about a third of the way through recruitment. However, when we're looking at the data as it's coming in, in terms of the PET-CT uh, studies, we do find that the fluoride tends to follow pattern of uptake in the coronary tree, which is well described for the areas of plaque rupture. So it does seem to be picking out the areas of the coronaries that are causing problems. What about patients with stable disease? Can the PET be of value there? So. Another study that Phil Adamson's doing uh, is looking at whether we can identify hot plaques in patients who apparently have stable coronary disease and whether dual antiplatelet therapy has a role. There is some evidence that dual antiplatelet therapy can prevent events in people after myocardial infarction for long-term use, but there's not an appetite for doing that in many places because uh, of bleeding risks. Uh, and also we don't want to put patients on all these tablets for too long. If we could identify the ones that are the most likely to run into trouble, then that would be a much better strategy, and that's the rationale for this. Can we use an imaging technique to do the personalized medicine approach of identifying those at the highest risk? We've also turned, uh, FD, uh, I'm slightly going off topic, uh, but, uh, if you, but it is still a vulnerable plaque in the aorta, arguably. Uh, we've been looking at aortic aneurysm disease, uh, uh, and Rachel uh, Forsyth has uh, done a nice study, uh, which we call the SOFIA study, where we've used sodium fluoride in patients with abdominal aortic aneurysms to see whether that can predict future uh, problems. Uh, and what she's been able to demonstrate is if you look in 72 people with abdominal aortic aneurysms and track their expansion rates, the aneurysms expand much faster in the top tertile of sodium fluoride uptake. So the more fluoride you take up in the aorta, the quicker your aneurysm grows. And not only that, if you look at those that then rupture or have it repaired, it's the top tertile that has that. Really quite exciting data, I think, because aneurysm uh, disease management has currently been ultrasound for the last 40 or 50 years, and nothing else seems to predict on top of that uh, anything additive. And here, this is adjusted for baseline di diameter, whether you smoke or not, your age, your sex, all the factors that we know predict outcome, that's all in the model already. Uh, so this is on top of current risk stratification. So really very exciting. 
where are we heading next in terms of the vulnerable plaque? We've heard a lot of that from Zahi. So I won't labour the point too much. We have lots of happy fellows, as you can see. Uh, and uh, Jack's job uh, is to, uh, uh, along with Adriana Tavares, is to develop a pet tracer that identifies thrombus, acute thrombus. Uh, and this is uh, the thrombus tracer we've been using. It's with, a, with a, uh, um, uh, a color probe attached to it. And you can see here it's li beautifully lighting up this ex vivo th human thrombus that we formed in the Badaman chamber, working really nicely. Uh, this is uh, um, the standard uh, femoral artery thrombus model. Um, uh, and again, showing it lights up beautifully. We are now getting to the point where we're hoping later this year to go into human, first into man studies, using this novel uh, thrombus tracer once we've finally nailed the peptide uh, chemistry, uh, which uh, is certainly seems to be progressing very well. So we may be able to not only tell whether it's vulnerable, but also whether it's got a clot sitting on the top of that plaque. Um, Zahi's already mentioned this to a degree in terms of uh, some of the fluoride imaging with PET, um, but with MR, of course, you can also see thrombus with T1 imaging, uh, T1 weighted imaging, uh, and you can see here uh, in this patient that uh, Vari uh, uh, recruited here in Edinburgh, uh, the, this patient had a massive uh, thrombus in their right coronary artery, which lit up beautifully uh, on the MR imaging. And then a strength of the PET MR, of course, is that we could use a thrombus tracer, which can be validated with this technique, or we could use fluoride tracing to show uh, that uh, this is a vulnerable plaque and then use the MR components to demonstrate the presence of in situ thrombus as well. So really the synergism there really coming out very nicely in terms of what we can do in the future. Um, this uh, is a, uh, an example of PET where we're having to use PET-CT interdigitating with MRI at the moment. This is a patient who's had a myocardial infarct. We're using MRI to, to look at the functional assessment of a patient and then we're using PET-CT with a different tracer. This time it's flucyclotide, which identifies uh, areas of new angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is also very important for plaque vulnerability. And what you're seeing uh, is a patient here who's had a stent. You can see the stent pointing out the uh, myocardial infarct here, uh, which is the flucyclotide being taken up in that infarct area of the myocardium. Uh, and what the MRI is telling you is that area where it took up that uh, flucyclotide, actually it did recover. The apex contracts much better. Uh, but going forward, we would have done this study using the PET MRI system, but we didn't have it at the time. Uh, and I think going forward, that would be really exciting. And it does light up plaque. So here's the, the, the flucyclotide lighting up uh, the atheroma in this person's aortic arch. Uh, and flucyclotide itself may be yet another marker of vo plaque vulnerability, as Ahi mentioned or alluded to. Uh, angiogenesis within a plaque is vulnerab causes vulnerability. Finally, there are other novel tracers. Oh, he already alluded to this with James Rudd's work in, in Cambridge, uh, using gallium dotatate uh, to do some coronary imaging. I think getting better macrophage markers uh, in the plaque is certainly the way forward, and we've got several novel tracers that we're trying to develop. And in addition, we're hoping to get some experience of gallium dotatate later this year. So, to summarize that gallop through the vulnerable plaque. Um, clearly, CT angiography holds the domain in terms of plaque identification. Fluoride is the best marker we have at the moment in terms of plaque vulnerability. Uh, and it has wide applications, both in carotid, coronary, and aortic disease. And I think the future is very bright for novel tracers. And certainly, with the advent of PET-MR, we should be able to do much more sophisticated and detailed studies to really risk stratify our patients. And then in the Scott Hart trial, maybe get that final bottom line even lower and really try and uh, prevent patients having these cardiovascular events. So just want to acknowledge the Scott Hart investigators, of which there were one or two, uh, and also to acknowledge everyone uh, back at the ranch, uh, but also, again, to thank Zahi uh, for his excellent collaboration over the years. Thanks very much. That's great, Dave. Thank you. I particularly enjoyed the comparison of Alistair Moss to Burke and Hare. That was the highlight for me. <laughs> um, has anyone got a question up in the audience? Dave, there, there's a lot of interest at the moment in cancer and other fields in very early diagnosis. And that will fundamentally change medicine mm -hmm. because at the moment we tend to have primary prevention, which we all 
adhere to and which reduces our chances in a non-mechanistic way of getting a disease. Mm -hmm. If you could diagnose a disease years ahead of when it's going to happen, then it raises the prospect of an early cure. Uh, and although there's no data to support this, if you think about chronic myeloid leukemia caused by the BCR ABLE translocation, if you could diagnose that years ahead from free DNA, then you could run trials to see whether the drug targeted to the mutine, imatinib, prevents the disease completely. So the question for me is, what are the molecular targets in the vulnerable plaque that are going to be opened up for intervention by very early diagnosis? Yeah. You know, uh, clearly you can do the usual things with statins and platelet uh, inhibitors and so on, but what are the, the, the really exciting disease-modifying yes. targets that you could be thinking about? So, uh, as always, John, a, a very insightful question. And I think, you know, arguably what I've just shown you is part of that answer uh, in the sense that um, CT angiography and coronary calcification, um, they're, 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 you know, that's quite advanced disease. And what the fluoride is telling you is before you get to that advanced disease. So we're getting earlier down that pathway. And for me, the fluoride is, is the plaque that could rupture and you need to calcify. And if you can calcify it off, it's going to be safe uh, or safer. Um, and so it's giving you an early signal of hazard. And what you're alluding to is can we do that even more? And I, I, I certainly believe and hope that the answer is yes to that. Um, I've alluded to some of the, uh, the flucyclotides and alpha V, beta 3, beta 5 integrin receptor uh, ligand. Um, there are some uh, interesting probes that we're developing in terms of other angiogenesis markers uh, that might be the stimulus. But again, you've got to have a plaque that then stimulates that. And I suppose it's then how far further back you go. We've gone back from calcium to fluoride to angiogenesis. Uh, and then can we get even smarter? And that, of course, relies on the fundamental understanding of what actually initiates that atheroma in the first place, which is challenging, but is not beyond the wit of man. And I think if we can continue to explore further and further back down that pathway, then your vision of trying to prevent it before it happens is absolutely there. Arguably, identifying soft plaque in the coronary artery is already here. And in Scott Heart trial, uh, there were a lot of patients that had events that had small soft plaques. Not huge numbers in proportion to everything, but there were still people having events who had non-obstructive disease. And actually identifying those and giving them a statin was part of the benefit of the Scott Heart trial. So actually spotting the disease early is true. And finally, my throwaway statement for that is also, I, as you know, I turned 50, uh, it's actually last year now, uh, and uh, then the prospect of the new revised guidelines came in, and I'm thinking, oh, God, I'm going to have to start taking a statin. And uh, my thought was, well, that's, I don't really want to take a statin if we've got the disease. And we know that the, the risk prediction tools overtreat people dramatically, as well as miss some people. So my precision medicine answer today is, can I have a CT coronary angiogram? And then I'll take my statin if there's a little plaque there. I'll do that, rather than have 10 years of taking it blindly and never knowing. And that might be an interesting question for society, I think, in terms of what they propose to put up with with screening and radiation dose to achieve that. I don't know, Zahi, if you've got anything to add to, to Professor Newby's comments. No, I, mean, I alluded it a little bit. I think if I understood your question, is, is what would be important target to go after? I, I'm excited about the inflammation. I, I think especially now with, with this IL-1 beta um, drug that could, they're showing that this is an important pathway that could decrease. Uh, and we have imaging tools uh, to assess inflammation, which the blood biomarker may not be may not be as easy. So I going back to to what David has said, I think if we if this becomes an important target to treat patients but also to find new drugs, I think the imaging will end up being center uh, to that assessment. Yeah. Great. So uh, in the interest of time we will uh, move on and uh, I'd, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Van Beek and Professor Wardlow are going to talk to us about some of the facilities that are available here for imaging. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I couldn't resist bringing the uh, BMJ award just in case anybody wants to know what it looks like. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's just an example of, uh, I think, what we are trying to do, and uh, uh, we'll talk about that. But uh, 
I think the main, the main gist is that uh, what you can see is we are really trying to integrate lots of different um, PIs and lots of different areas of research and integrate it with our imaging knowledge and imaging expertise. Um, so what we, we, we put together is a, a, sh a short overview of sort of what the facilities are like now and how do you access it because we get these questions quite a lot. So I'd like to do imaging, how do I get in? How do I get in? So um, in terms of the facilities, as you can see here, we have a, a big campus and there's a, obviously the campus is only expanding, it's still hidden by that big block in the middle, but you've seen the building across the road and I think the key handover is at the end of the year. And what we now have is uh, in RIE, that's uh, basically uh, the, the brain optimized uh, three Tesla scanner. Uh, in this building in the basement, we have that's QMRI, so we have three Tesla MRI uh, white bore, uh, MR PET, PET CT, there's two of those, uh, one's for the NHS and one we've taken over from the NHS, is now 100% research and had it all upgraded. And in that also we have a psychotron and a radiochemistry facility and that's now sort of getting pushed for um, for uh, for access to some extent because we're sort of running out of space to and, and times to actually produce all these radiochemistry uh, products that we need. Uh, then the next in the building next door we have a seven Tesla MRI and micro pet for the small animal work. Uh, and th then there's two campuses outside. One's at the Western General where the where original uh, brain research imaging uh, center scanner is still based. So we call it now facility WGH. And then we have the vet school where they have actually uh, two places. One at the farm where they have uh, an animal a facility with CT and a critical care facility for large animals, largely to look at, uh, look at toxicology and things like that. And uh, the announcement of the uh, large animal research imaging facility where the funding has now been agreed and that we're expecting will open in 2019. That will see the CT scan move in there together with the three Tesla whole, whole body large animal MRI facility. Uh, not to mention that we also then have uh, an equine uh, hospital which has uh, uh, formed a partnership to look at robotic x-ray to see these horses move uh, around. This is uh, quite a challenge, I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, as well as uh, the normal standard um, uh, imaging diagnostics that are required in the vet school with MRI and CT. Um, so, if we go with the and then of course we, uh, we do have integrated, sorry, I nearly forgot to mention the most important part which is image analysis of course, so we have all these images and now we need to make sense out of them. Uh, and, and also part of this is then the data management of how we store these images, how we send them around and things like that. I'll pass over to Joanne. Uh, one of the key p points here is that this is very much a partnership between the University of Edinburgh and the NHS, um, which means that we function across hospitals and uh, in research right through to translation. And it would not be possible also without a substantial investment and availability of expertise in all the scientific aspects of uh, delivering imaging research, which provides a very large footprint in comparison with many other centers in the UK and potentially also in Europe. Um, so basically all of the facilities that any of you might need to do any, really any form virtually of imaging research are available on site, a wide range of modalities um, all the necessary scientific, technical, and administrative expertise, um, multi-modality, multi-organ, multi-disease translation between species. It's brought together by having one uh, project and facility administration. So instead of kind of scurrying around and trying to find out about all sorts of um, where you get information and that sort of thing, it's all under one umbrella and there's one facility administration. There's one process for managing the IT, for doing things like tracking the scanning, for managing image archives. Uh, it's networked across all of the sites for image analysis and we also have increasing image data banks representing um, collections of particular uh, characteristics. We have extensive experience of uh, ethics and regulatory experience and the facilities all operate to GCP standards with, uh, many would require, suggest vast range of standard operating procedures, but unfortunately that's all necessary now in the current regulatory environment. We also have an extensive system of communication. There's a website which is very informative. We run seminars and there's a fantastic environment for getting access to um, imaging science uh, expertise. And we're also networked uh, both locally throughout Scotland through the Synapse Initiative, um, which is 10 years old uh, this year, 
uh, across the UK through initiatives such as the MRC Dementia Platform, various cardiology networks and oncology networks, and globally through a number of neurological, cardiological and trials networks, um, uh, which we are either leading or involved in. My turn. So here's the latest update for what we have then downstairs. So um, last year we had a very um, extensive uh, rebuilding program. It's quite challenging because obviously in the basement and there's walls and you can't move them all. Um, but we uh, managed to uh, get in place uh, an MR PET uh, system that you can see here with the covers off. Um, so you can see the, the PET uh, site and I already showed a picture of that. Uh, that's the existing uh, three Tesla whole body uh, vario uh, MRI system. This is the uh, PET CT. This uh, was completely upgraded both in hardware and software at the same time. Here you have the cyclotron opened up uh, because we need a lot more uptake rooms for patients because we now have three PET systems where we used to have one. Um, so it's quite a challenge. So we had a lot of things to fit around to ensure that uh, we could make optimal use of this equipment. Um, we uh, obviously have cyclotron and hot cells and this is uh, I think the next uh, bottleneck. You seem to run from one bottleneck to the next but that's, that's the way these things go and in fact we don't really mind that because it's sort of a sign of how uh, the busier we are the better it is because it is means that we are being uh, required for all the research and therefore uh, we are very much part of uh, a lot of grants uh, throughout the building and beyond. Uh, apart from uh, obviously the research side I should mention that we are also offering clinical services, so this is jointly run with the NHS, uh, who have the PET CT there, but we also run services on this upgraded uh, system because we used to have a, a dedicated CT scanner, we don't have that anymore, so we use this now as our CT scanner as well and provide services for uh, cardiac imaging and several national uh, centers in the, in, the, in the hospital next door. Uh, this uh just tells you a little bit more about the other um, recent acquisition, which is the installation of a state-of-the-art uh, 3T MR scanner actually in the hospital, right next to the A&E department. Um, it's in the imaging department, which means it has immediate access to all of the um, radiological resources. And it runs on a similar model to the system which has been at the Western General for the best part of approaching 20 years. Um, and was also sitting in the neuroradiology department. The fact that it's in a hospital means that you can examine patients who are acutely unwell and there's already a building portfolio of uh, uh, patient studies. Um, it's also accessible to um, obviously outpatients and healthy volunteers. It is brain optimized but it is quite capable of doing all sorts of other forms of uh, body imaging um, and it has a particular interest in trying to understand more about the brain across the life course. And we've already started studies of uh, neonatal um, subjects as part of the Edinburgh um, birth cohort to match the Lothian birth cohort, which has had such a massive impact uh, on understanding uh, aging and uh, cognitive aging in particular. Um, Edmund. So I'll speak to this because obviously we do have a close collaboration with the uh, animal side of things. So you've already seen this uh, this image here, which is an example of a micro pet uh, CT image that's installed next door together with an existing 7 test small animal MRI scanner. Um, that of course has, needs uh, support from the, that same radiochemistry department downstairs, hence uh, our challenges that uh, we have to make sure we can provide all these uh, requests for radiochemicals. And then in the LARIF, um, this, uh, this sort of CT work we do, this is basically a, a, a PIC model, which, uh, which is uh, a toxicology mo a model that's been used. And we keep these PICs alive in an intensive care facility, so you don't have to do multiple PICs. You can reduce the number of animals required to study. Uh, so that's, that makes perfect sense. But you also get more longitudinal information as to what actually truly happens. And using CT, you can see the development and disappearance of ARDS, for instance. Uh, this is the robotic x-ray uh, system that I was talking about. This can move in all directions effectively. Uh, obviously it's meant for uh, people, so you can imagine uh, that actually if you put a horse in there, that's got its challenges. So we had Siemens in Erlangen, they now have a horse in the factory to reprogram this whole system. Uh, so uh, the vet school put, a, put a, a horse model that they use for, for teaching in the factory in Erlangen so they can actually reprogram this thing so it can move around horses to ensure that yeah, you can see them as well. 
image analysis, um, uh, vital piece. Um, uh, these people, I think, um, it's a, it's a core lab facility. It does a lot of work for effectively almost all uh, uh, researchers that will pass uh, image analysis sooner or, or later. Um, I think it's uh, you see some examples. So we have you know pet images, we have uh, prenatal images, breast studies, cardiac studies, things about. Uh, the mouth and how the, how speech works, uh, body fat uh, measurements, and the, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, I think this sort of uh, old, if you look, if you add it all up, it's I think a re really good example of team science. And I think that's one of those things that's starting to get recognised a little bit. But you need a big team to actually make sense of all the things that are coming out, and whether it's computer science or whether it's image analysis science or whatever, it doesn't really matter. But this team science approach is what's making us, I think, very successful. Uh, so a few practical details. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to, uh, when you're thinking about doing a study that uses imaging. I mean, I know so many people, we all know so many people who go to conferences, they hear about some fancy new imaging technique, they rush home, they phone you up at five in the morning, um, they say, oh, I've just heard about this, I really must do it, blah, blah, blah. Um, often with relatively little understanding of just how complicated or detailed it might need to be and what resources might be required, et cetera. So help is at hand. Uh, if you look at the Edinburgh Imaging website, there is lots of information about what you should think about and where to go and talk to people to get more information about things when you're trying to design your study. Uh, there are people with all sorts of expertise who are here to help you. Um, uh, it will also help you get through some of the regulatory issues uh, to apply for your study make sure you're choosing the right modality, that you're doing it in the right place for the patient group or subject group that you're interested, the modality you're interested in. And most unfortunately and importantly, uh, you need to think about how much will it cost. And you must do that very early on because all of the research that we do is grant funded. Um, so it's very important to have identified um, costs. Um, here's just an illustration of a number of the different people that you can go and talk to as a first point of contact. Uh, uh, for various different aspects. It's all on the website. I strongly encourage you to uh, go through it. And it's also got lots of examples of ongoing research and published research and highlights and so forth. And yet again, um, uh, how much will it cost? Um, so how much will it cost? Well, if I may have labored that point a few times, it's because imaging research is exceptionally expensive. And we are not NASA any more than um, our uh, um, speaker has been uh, NASA endowed either and uh, we're very fortunate that the university has been very proactive in supporting the uh, ongoing investments in imaging but we currently have something like a 35 million footprint in terms of the equipment and associated estate and just the recent investment in the last year has been in the region of 14 million including not just the equipment but the facilities um, expansion which has been required to um, accommodate it and we're very very grateful to a number of um, very generous donors and particularly the MRC and the Wellcome Trust and a number of other charitable um, organizations. Just uh, as an indication of why understanding the cost is so important, our current basic equipment maintenance budget is about £650,000. The basic consumables just to run the scanners are about £700,000 and the salary budget, not including all of the people who are funded on specific research grants because that's their research fellowship or whatever, is about £2 million. So there's a lot to cover, um, but we have very extensive um, experience of costing studies and our costs, um, judging by review of lots of other grant applications going into other funding bodies, um, are extremely competitive, so you can be reassured that uh, whatever you're being asked to pay after you've fallen out over and picked yourself off the floor, don't do that, um, because they are extremely reasonable and um, we are basically covering our costs. Uh, so, uh, just to finish up, uh, this was a few snapshots from the visit in February when Princess Anne came very kindly to open the new facilities and also uh, some uh, examples of the teams of individuals who were involved in um, various of the different uh, imaging resources. And just to draw to your attention again, um, the recent award of the uh, BMJ Award for Imaging uh, to the team primarily at the Crick. Uh, congratulations again. Um, so, uh, we have a very long-term commitment 
uh, primarily to advancing health through imaging research, and there are lots of examples of that, some of which you've heard about this morning, major impact locally, uh, nationally, and globally. Uh, we have very good academic leadership creating this environment in which it's uh, ideal to do imaging research, extensive global collaborations. If we can't solve the problem, we probably know somebody who can. Uh, lots of examples of local innovation in both research but also in working practices. You know, running these things is like running a very large corner shop. Um, and there are efficient ways of doing it and there are inefficient ways of doing it. And because research budgets are limited, the more efficient you can get, the better. Uh, we have a big educational profile which you'll be able to hear about a little bit later on today. Um, so, fantastic equipment and expertise. Um, a very bright future for imaging research here um, and enjoy it. Hopefully you won't need a helicopter because there's a helicopter deck. <laughs> Thank you.